period. Um, I want to start with uh, some introductions um, for people in the front of the room. First of all, um, Professor Betty Lisa Anderson, would you like to say a few words or say about yourself or, I mean. Uh, the, uh, I'm old, I work in electrical engineering and I do a lot of K-12 outreach uh, about engineering stuff. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, Professor Juan Wilson Gubres. I hope I pronounced your name right. That's good enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm Juan de San Gabriel from, I'm a professor of molecular epidemiology in uh, veterinary medicine area. I also direct global health programs. I'm originally from Ethiopia and you guys have some Ethiopia projects, but I read some of the projects, they're all interesting projects. I look forward to hear what your presentation looks like and your concepts, ideas uh, look like, but that word expert, I'm very far from. <laughs> <laughs> that shows he's a real expert because he's willing to say he's not. I have the same issue. Um, so in the format, I know I've said this to you before, 10 minute talks, 10 minute slides, I'll be the timekeeper and just cut you off. Um, the, the professors have already um, been given um, on uh, Monday uh, your reports. Okay, so you're gonna hit five points, 10 minute discussion. Um, the order we're gonna do it is, um, Ethiopia um, project, um, STEM, the Sterling engine, STEM, the cooperative lights, and, the, and then the projects for El Salvador and Nicaragua. Um, now, I sent you an email a little bit ago, final reports, the final, final reports, um, due May 4th, 5 p.m., Dropbox, put everything there, thing there, okay, and then I'll post at the, the course website. If you have no changes from what you get turned in already, just submit it, resubmit the same thing, okay? But if you have some changes from the inputs today from the professors or from um, other students, um, maybe put a few changes in or at least put it something at the end of the doc saying these issues need to be addressed. You don't need to fully address all the issues that are coming up, okay? I wanna make clear on this. I mean, this is just for a few changes, you know, some final words, okay? And then give me all the files. I like them in doc, in doc form where, or XLS form where, where possible. Um, and uh, so the um, that's it for my part. Um, now um, you're up first, Ethiopia. Who's the presenter? Me, Mark. All right, Mark. Um, let me just get you set up on a slide here on your slide and then you're off and running. I would ask um, where possible, please stand by the mic or I'll move the mic um, to what the greatest extent I can. Are you gonna, you wanna stand over there? No, I can stand over there. I okay. A lovely assistant. All right, great. You're on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi everyone, my name's uh, Mark Andrews. I'm the leader of team two and our, assist our project was water filtration and purification systems for rural Ethiopia. Uh, you can see our team members there. Uh, we have our filter here. The pur purification part of it is uh, SOTUS, solar disinfection. So that part we won't actually be able to display. Uh, we had several collaborators on the project from Ethiopia. Two of them are in the class, Imani and Universe. Uh, the other four, Retta, Ash, Abraham, and Getachew, were associates of one of our team members at a gym that he goes to. So we talked to them about uh, different things. You can see some extremely dirty water. We're gonna pour it into our filter there and uh, it takes a little while to go through. So uh, we'll let that work while I continue with the presentation. So why did we pick water and why did we choose Ethiopia? So water was kind of, it's just because there are four essential things that everyone needs for life. Food, air, water, and shelter. And water is one of the ones that can easily be improved and really make a big difference in people's lives. It's often the first thing to go bad and it's also easy to make better. Uh, as for why we chose Ethiopia, well, we want to do something in Sub-Saharan Africa because that's where poverty is really extreme and there's a lot of problems there. Um, Ethiopia happens to have the second highest population in Africa after Nigeria and the third highest multi-dimensional poverty index in Africa and also the world. So 52% of the population does not have access to, or does have access to an improved water source, but nearly 100% in the urban areas do. That number is closer to about 40% in the rural areas. So that's why we're, in particular, we're trying to focus on rural parts of Ethiopia. And with the number of people there, it can make a big difference uh, if we improve their water. Some of the things we had to take into con uh, consideration while we were doing our design, the geography and climate, Ethiopia is slightly north of the equator. It's very sunny, hot. Uh, there's highlands, lowlands, it's a landlocked country. Um, seasonal water supplies, things like that. Cultural norms, typically in rural Ethiopia, in the villages, women are sent to gather water and they have these large plastic containers that they have to 
haul on their back several miles, get their water, bring it back, and then use it. The environment materials, that's a picture of a landfill in Ethiopia. Um, it looks like trash, but it could be treasure. There are materials in there that could be used for this uh, project. And the housing, that's called a tukul hut. Um, it's a typical uh, dwelling for rural Ethiopians, and we needed to take that in mind for our SOTUS part of the project. Some of the key requirements we kept in mind when we were doing the design. Um, capacity, we figure a five gallon minimum is pretty good. That's about 40 pounds worth of water, roughly what people are carrying on their back. Um, so a five gallon capacity is the absolute minimum that we want to do. Turbidity is a measure of the cloudiness of water. So what went in there was several hundred NTU worth of turbidity. Um, the goal for the output, in order for SOTUS to work, it has to be 30 NTU or less. That milk jug is approximately 30 NTU. Uh, what <laughs> water looks like, and they have one as well. Uh, end use container size. Two liter is the maximum. Anything larger than that, the UV light from the sun can't penetrate as much of the water and do the disinfection. Speed, less than a day. That's a pretty lax requirement, but the goal is that they would add water one day, it filters, they use that water for disinfection the next day, and then the day after that is when they actually use it. So there's kind of a three-day buildup before this system actually becomes in use uh, once it's implemented. And the last things are some uh, requirements on the materials. They have to be weather and pest resistant, use replaceable and preferably modular components, and it has to be very simple to operate. So the final design, uh, as you can see it over there, this is uh, some pictures we took during construction. Um, essentially, you take a bucket and you drill a hole in the bottom of it, and we took a sink drain cover and put it over the top, put some thicker gravel on top of that, then you go a little finer, finer and finer sand on top, uh, the, the drain cover and the thicker gravel help stop filter material from falling through. And then you get coarser again as you go up to filter out the big stuff before it gets to the fine grain things. Um, most challenging parts of this, if you're doing this in Ethiopia, drilling a hole, you know, they don't, they're probably not going to have a Black & Decker sitting by them to drill the hole. And the bulkhead, you can see this PVC bulkhead, it's not necessarily needed for every installation, but if they need it, you need to find a way to get that uh, sourced in Ethiopia. The instructions, so there are photographic instructions, which uh, Sarah can hand out right now. She made some copies. Um, we made them photographic so that if there's any problems with literacy, education out in the rural areas, uh, hopefully the pictures will be able to convey how to use the um, equipment. And so does after the filter, you know, the filter works pretty simply. You pour the dirty water in, the clean water comes out. And sodas can be done anywhere. You see a sodas rack here that's a corrugated tin roof. Uh, it's very useful for sodas, but the Tukul huts also have a uh, slanted roof that you can, people can put the water bottles right on the roof of their own house, and that could be where they do their sodas disinfection. Uh, in addition to the filter and the sodas, we also made a few accessories. This is a turbidimeter. Um, it's essentially just a plastic tube with a secu, it's called a secu disc at the bottom. Um, you fill it with water, and once you can't see the pattern at the bottom of the tube anymore, that gives you an indicator of what the turbidity is. The red line is the 30 NTU mark. Uh, the yellow line is about 10, and the top of it is about 5, which is uh, 5 is preferable for drinking water, and uh, 30 is the bare minimum that you need for sodas. We also made a timekeeper. Uh, we actually made two different ones. The, the one pictured is not the one we have here. Um, but all it is, so about 8 hours worth of disinfection would be good in the sun. You point one end of it at where the sun is when you start, and then once the sun passes the other end of it, uh, you know eight hours has passed and everything should be disinfected. Last thing up there is ceramic filters. Uh, something that we wanted to do, <coughs> weren't able to accomplish, um, is if you take clay and add something like sawdust to it, uh, when you fire it in a kiln, the sawdust will burn away and the clay, clay hardens and that becomes very porous. So you can use that as a filter instead of a sand filter or uh, a purchase filter. The cost of maintenance, the total cost of everything you see over there was $17.92. Now that was more expensive than what we wanted to be, but the 8, 887 of it was for the bulkhead alone. And that is something, like I said, it's optional. It depends. Once you do the actual installation, you get to see what people uh, need and whether or not they need that stuff. Um, and it was 258 per bucket. As I showed in the previous picture, they have containers already that they're using for water. So hopefully, they wouldn't have to purchase every single uh, part that they're using for the filter. Um, that's why actual materials used can be different and a lot of the things should be available locally. For maintenance, uh, the, the only real maintenance it needs is the filter will need uh, replacement every now and again. 
depending on the type of filter used, uh, if they have clay, they might go with a ceramic filter as a local resource. If not, if they use a sand filter, it's unclear how often it would need to be replaced right now. That would need more research, more data. Um, but that, no matter what kind of filter you use, you're gonna have to replace it eventually. Everything else is cleanable um, and resistant to weather and aging. So there shouldn't be too much maintenance required for this uh, technology. So the path forward, scalability. So one of the big things about this is how flexible it can be. Um, for technology, the technology itself can be scaled up by having larger reservoirs. Rather than five gallon buckets, you can use 55 gallon drums. Um, the filter itself could also be scaled up, same way. And uh, geographically, there's nothing unique about this technology that it has to be used in Ethiopia. Anywhere that has access to water, sunlight, and plastic bottles can make filters um, and use the SOTUS method. Uh, when you're actually implementing it, uh, the flexible design, by, you can tailor it to local resources. If they have clay, teach them how to make ceramic filters, and uh, that can be a local industry then once you leave. Um, if they don't have clay, you teach them about biosand filters and how to make those. And if nothing is available, hopefully they have a way that they can purchase uh, actual filters um, through some market there. And uh, if there's heavy metals present in their water, and you know that, uh, one possible way to uh, treat that is with water hyacinth, which is a plant um, that's pretty easy to grow. You can grow it, place it in the reservoir with the heavy metal uh, tainted water, and it will absorb heavy metals. And then you have to, di you have to find a way to discard the water hyacinth afterwards, uh, which could be a challenge. So in summary, um, clean water is an essential pressing need in Ethiopia, uh, particularly in the rural areas. And because of how many people are in Ethiopia, by treating it there and where it's located within Africa, it's next to Kenya and Djibouti and Ethiopia itself have all done, been doing fairly well in recent years, but it's also got Sudan and Somalia on either side of it and Eritrea and you know a little more trouble there. So hopefully by doing it here, it can spread and maybe bring a little less unrest to those areas. Um, and the simple and flexible design can have large impacts. Here's the, oh. the water. This is, there's still more coming out, but this is how much you got. As you saw, it was really, really bad. This is what come out, comes out as. You can get it even cleaner by putting it through again. We tested that yesterday, and it worked out fairly well. And you can see it's clearer than the, the 30 NTU. Um, so it would not be all the way down to the 5 NTU that we were going for, but it's probably about 10 to 15. So it could be useful to this so it's uh, perfectly fine for some of this. Microorganisms in it. Yep. Okay. Okay. Questions. Any questions? You want to start? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any minute? Let's start. Okay. If you want to start. So, <laughs> uh, let's start with just a basic question of uh, the durability. I like, definitely like a you know, huge difference between the original you showed us versus what's filtering out. But what is the average? I'm just curious regular river water to start with that an average Ethiopian will take, you know, not stepping on it or making it muddy, but mm -hmm. what is the turbidity of it? So, so that milk water. jug is actually untreated water out of a pond. Okay. That is just a retention pond uh, that Kyle knew about and he just grabbed that water and that's about 30 MTU. That's about 30. Yeah. And how much your system would improve from that? So the, what went in there was hundreds of MTU, um, but it is kind of an exponential scale. So you can see on the, uh, actually if you, Look at the turbidity meter. Right, so it reduces 100 to 30. That's wonderful. Yeah, it goes like 1,000 to 30, and then up to here is a 10, and then right. up to here, it's not even 5 up here, it's about 60. But from a 30, if you start with a 30, does it improve the 30 further, yeah. or 30 will come out of 30 if the input was 30? It, when we put it in yesterday, we started as this, and it came out uh, clearer than it was here. It was, I think, about, what do you think? Right there. Yeah, close to the green. So probably went from 30 to maybe 12. Okay. There, there are, you can't put a mark for every turbidity level on those tubes, um, but this was just a rough estimate. Okay. So definitely, um, this is very impressive. Let me first, I didn't really commend you, but it was impressive to read. Lots of the details of background you did, as well as uh, what you're trying to achieve in your presentation. So that's, that's great. Uh, but getting into a more practical question, so how much, um, you know, or how long a durability do you think a system, even if it's because the initial cost might be is an issue, you mm -hmm. indicated that, that's a very good point to mm -hmm. raise. 
But if they make it affordable and once they install it, is this something that's durable? Or something that they need to switch more regularly every how often? So one of the, uh, the hopes, one of the challenges of the project is we're not in Ethiopia and we don't know what, what's there. Um, but one of the hopes is that this could turn into a local industry. You know, somebody could be making, by, by making it just a bucket, that's modular. You can take your filter, just remove it, set aside, get a new bucket and put it there. Um, and then somebody can, you can recycle the old bucket and get new filter material in there. Um, but uh, as far as durability, I mean, it's all just, you know, PVC and plastic. It's pretty rugged. Um, it shouldn't be moving too much once it's in use. Um, so hopefully it'll be dur durable enough. Um, but how long the filter lasts okay. is... So it depends on yeah, the filter concept. Yeah. I think it's all like good. sand and bio, uh, bio filter, so it can be replaced with stuff just around gravel. You don't need to really buy any um, mm. particular, like you don't need to buy another filter, you can just make another one. Yeah. Should we have everybody else stand up too? Or? Does everybody yeah, want to sure. stand Question. up? Yeah. This is the rest of the girls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, one question. Um, the, I guess I want to understand too. Um, it, picking up with what he was just saying, <coughs> Professor Gabrace, um So, do you know how much I guess um, water you can put through? Let's say the turbidity on the input was fixed because mm -hmm. it's a regular source. Let's say that the turbidity was fifty. Do you know how much water could go through the filter before maintenance would be needed? Do you have any idea, or is that hard to determine? Or that would be really hard. We need to do a lot more tests and see yeah. the buildup and if, uh, over time how much the water quality changes as we put it through. So that would take a, a decent amount of testing. A lot, a lot of testing, right? Yeah. So, so you, you, do you have any insights from your simulation? 50, 50, 50. Keep repeating it, and then plot. Right, the output, mm -hmm. yeah. the output turbidity over time, and decide. Um, I guess it would go up. I should it would go up, and then um, it would hit some threshold that was unacceptable. Which I, would you know? What's the unacceptable threshold? It would be below thirty because the biggest the biggest reason we're filtering it is so when the so we put the sodas in effect to kill all the microorganisms, it needs to be at least less than thirty. Gotcha. Um, so what's his 30, so it becomes a lot less ineffective, ineffective, um, so, well, less, less, a lot less effective. Right. Um, so so it's there, we need to replace it. So if you hit 30, do you know, does the science say that sodas will take it to a drinking water quality of, drinking, wa drinking water quality, or are we talking here about washing your dishes or something? What, what are we going to do with the water? Uh, it's definitely drinking water quality. Drinking water quality. Um, the, I believe some institute in Sweden, um, I think it was Sweden, that came up with this method, and it's implemented in decent other places around the world. Um, and it's for drinking water. It will kill every 99.9% .9 I think of microorganisms in a six hour period. When it's in the sun, you UV rays, as long as there is available sun, it's not like super cloudy all day, then you need to leave it longer. Is there, is there any issues with taste? Have you read about that? I didn't see anything. When I was looking around, I didn't see anything. Because if you can have essentially water that's okay to drink that doesn't taste good, and people won't drink it mm -hmm. because they think it's contaminated or yeah. simply tastes bad, and they're not going to drink it. And that's as far as the drinking water quality of turbidity. Uh, Thirty NTU is acceptable for sodas, and it's acceptable for drinking. Uh, but what people prefer is around closer to ten or less, typically. Right. Um, so that's like I say the. The bottle there, the, the small Coke bottle, the 20 ounce, that's probably around 12. And I think most of us, if we looked at that, we said, oh, that water looks a little little off. Do I, do I want to drink that? And it's okay, not clear. So is anybody on the team drank water? <laughs> no, because we haven't disinfected it. So this, yeah. we had dirt that we added to the water, and we'd have to leave it out in the sun. You haven't done it we're through sodas yet? No. no. It's oh, been, okay. With the clouds, it would take a lot longer. And plus, yeah. the way we have it, if it's so close to the equator, it's going to be a direct correlation to how long it lasts, so it would be harder to implement it here where the sun's less direct. We actually saved it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but that assumes that I trust you, Bob. <laughs> now, Katie, I would trust you. I don't know, Bob. No. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but it makes a great story, right? I don't know if we'd want to put it in the on-campus news that you did this and drank it, but um, <laughs> but I think that for someone who's an engineer is trying to do this should have that in mind. You, you, before you would give it to anyone else, you should be willing to drink it yourself. Very true. And our goal for this project is to have the filtration part as large scale as you can, so it's more of like a communal use, and then have the sodas kind of uh, implemented within the households as like a more individual, so it adds to like the community and yeah, you can have a technical expert on the filter and knowing when the turbidity level is okay and things like that. Right. So, uh, let me just add one mm -hmm. more question. Uh, being from health sciences field, myself, in fact, I work on foodborne pathogens, mainly salmonella. Um, I want to comment as well as really question. Number one, when you talk about quality, there is aesthetic aspect of turbidity or there is heavy metal hazards in the microbial mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned. So you may have you know, less turbidity or 5% mm -hmm. or 0%, very nice clean water, but highly contaminated. Mm -hmm. Or you may have the reverse, aesthetically not attractive, but you know, microbial-wise, much better. Right. Uh, my comment is this issue of, I saw in your document here, 99% will be down by 6 hours, 8 hours mm -hmm. sunlight and UV. I'm not sure when you, the moment you get into the quality of the bacteria, you get into the microbial organisms. Anyways, 99.9% percent, point nine percent mm -hmm. of what we see in the world that are not harmful bacteria. Mm -hmm. But those uh, few 1%, which are huge, right. salmon and others are, they survive very well, mm -hmm. by the way. They can survive mm -hmm. three months. Uh, we found, you know, we have so many publications uh, on this area, and they can survive very well. So how do you really, when you say disinfection, in that eight hours, which mm. may kill, you know, the mild commensal type of organisms versus making it safe, it will be a challenge, there is no doubt. But I don't know if you have thought about how, you know, disinfect or sterilize, that mm. is the right terminology versus even getting rid of the organisms is right. my point. So can you elaborate further or any of you on your team? I know that uh, in the soda publication that we use in the I believe it's in the reports, uh, there are certain organisms that do get killed by the soda system. And look, comparing that to what is generally seen in the water sources, um, all the major ones with the major health problems, such as uh, E. coli, um, fecal uh, coliform. Yeah, I think uh, there there was a whole list that did kill. I I didn't do enough in depth research to see what it didn't kill. If there's any of that, but I can see that since it's been implemented in many places in the world, that at least has some sort of um, quality in purifying it. Um, just to add to that too, um, the filter itself also removes some of the microorganisms, so um, I'm not sure which ones that are dangerous in particular, like Cryptosporidium maybe, um, that might be able to get removed through the filtration process as well, making so this more effective. Mm -hmm. yeah, as the larger ones like Ripsos, but the larger maybe yeah. possible. One of the key um, bacteria that tem tends to be found in drinking water is fecal coliform bacteria from sanitation problems and, and runoff into uh, water sources, and so this is effective for that particular uh, yeah. strain. The fecal coliform is one thing. There are so right. many. Oh, yeah, oh, there's, coli, there's certainly plenty. The same reason that E. coli O157, you hear it a lot, that's mm -hmm. dangerous. So it's many of the fecal coliform are. And the ceramic filters can have a smaller pore size, which may help mm -hmm. further with the smaller organisms. There are ways you can coat the ceramic filter with a silver colloid material that actually is also an antimicrobial <laughs> properties. Um, but we didn't look into that as far as how expensive it is and how, it has, how it's actually done. But um, do you know what micrometer or nanometer can, can it filter? Is it yeah, so it's like 0.6 micrometer uh, for the ceramic filter. Uh, what we have generally, uh, which is an inexpensive uh, filter. But as you reduce the pore size, the flow rate also reduces. So there is basically a, a the requirement a trade -off. between yeah. uh, the flow rate as well as the pore size and the, what, the amount of clarity what you want for water. As far as soil is concerned, uh, it's already already been implemented in many parts of the world and it's already it's supported by World Health Organization. Uh, 
So we kind of base our study on the technique, technique which has been proven over and over again uh, throughout the time. Yeah, it is hard to prove it's anything. Small steps uh, to make the yeah. water. Uh, no, it's, it's, yeah, it's, a, yeah. honestly, it's a great step in a way that even in, in Ethiopia, as well as many sub-Saharan Africa or Asia, Latin America, there's lots of parasites mm -hmm. which are fairly large. Mm -hmm. So if you can filter like 0.6 micron, you can already really take care of many of, mm -hmm. not the bacteria you've been referring to for but the parasitic ones which can mm -hmm. be filtered. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, STEM team uh, Sterling Engine presenter, um, please come up. Uh, oh, jeez. If you can uh, try to stay. Okay. <laughs> All right, forward back. All yours. Okay. Um, go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Um, my name is Josh, and I'm the team leader of Group 3. And we decided to try and build a Sterling engine. We wanted to build a program for high school age kids um, to try and get them involved with math and science and stuff and get them interested in, you know, kind of the inner workings of an engine. So I'll start with our proposal here. I guess we could kind of start off by saying we did not, we're not claiming to like make the first ever Sterling engine. Um, this is, it's actually like a really popular thing online. But, so we had to kind of make our own program. We wanted to make a manual for the teachers and directions for the students so they knew what they were doing and kind of what they could expect. Um, and that was a big process for us because we had to kind of fine tune what our directions would be like and what our engine would look like because there's so, there's a, I mean, there's a ton of different types that you can make. Um, the reason we picked this was because it's, it can be made out of common materials like cardboard and pop cans and stuff, and it makes it really cool because it's inexpensive and it's stuff you can find laying around the house. Um, I don't know if you guys remember like back in high school when they tell you to bring a milk carton in because you're gonna build a gingerbread house or something. It's something you could think about and get excited. Um, maybe you think, hey, I'll bring a pop can in on Friday and we're gonna make this cool project. Something kids can get excited about. Um, in our in our report, we included that there's three different types of Sterling engines. Um, and I think actually the mechanical engineering program here makes one. And we had to kind of decide which one we wanted to make. Um, and that, I mean, this is like a big long process to figure out, you know, realistically what we could do. So after we, you know, we had a, a process of figuring that out. Um, eventually, we wanted to implement it into a high school classroom. Uh, that would be our target audience. We thought, you know, those would be kids that would probably understand and get the most out of what we're doing here. Um, but, I mean, it's still fun for, like, college age kids, too. I, I think we kind of enjoyed it as well. And it doesn't even limit it to that. The teachers and adults <laughs> enjoy it, too. Um, and then lastly, the humanitarian aspect that we were kind of bringing to this was you know, we're, we're probably not saving any lives with this maybe, but we're trying to enrich these kids like thirst for knowledge and maybe, you know, they'll enjoy it and it would, you know, kind of be like a stepping stone onto further education for them. So I will get into what a Sterling engine is in case you guys don't know. It's, it's really similar to what, you know, you think of an engine in a car or something. You're going to have a cylinder here, which will be made out of a pop can in the end. And um, you're still gonna have a piston and a displacer on the inside. The only real difference here is that it runs on a heat differential. Instead of you know what you're used to normally is an engine running on combustion. Instead, you're gonna put a heat source underneath that cylinder and as it expands the fluid that's in the cylinder, which in this case is air, it's going to push this displacer up and that will in turn, you know, spin that, that shaft and it'll spin the flywheel and that's how you like create power. Um, the reason why we picked this 
was because it was like an easy and realistic science experiment and it's already really popular i'm i'm sure all you guys have heard of instructables.com um there's tons of designs on there there's a ton on youtube and it, it really gave us like a wide range of what we could pick from and again to drive this home it's a, a great do-it-yourself project and you can do it you know with next to nothing so we'll get into how to build one here um, the diagram I guess you'll see on your right is from a set of directions we got from a guy whose name is Jim Larson um, this is just one of the really simple kinds we have here and you can see it's the, the pop can what you don't see is a candle underneath the pop can that's going to be your heat source but then from there out everything else is really similar and you look at the you know the materials we're using for this a balloon and you know a CD and stuff is all kind of like junk laying around your house that you you know you could dig out and make something out of it and um, you know honestly I, I bet if you've ever been on instructables.com you probably like making stuff out of junk so it kind of makes sense um, and then you know obviously cardboard it's lightweight really cheap and you probably have a ton laying around the house so once we kind of decided on what our engine would look like we had to begin you know, a process to implement it into a classroom. So we already had, you know, our driving point here is that it's cheap, easy materials. Um, the thing that we would find out was a little bit difficult was the build time, because there's a lot of, you know, glue drying, um, tinkering with the objects. You gotta kind of tweak it. It's not gonna come out perfect every time, but, you know, that I think that's kind of a good thing for students who are problem solvers to figure out. So then, after we figured out what we were making, we had to design the manual, you know, which took a little bit of time, but you're gonna see here a student and a teacher manual, which is just gonna have, you know, step-by-step -step instructions for them. And we had to like cut it real, you know, clear for them what, you know, what we were supposed to make. And, you know, if we wanted this to be an easy process, we had to make, you know, step-by-step step-by-step -step instructions kind of like if you were building something from ikea you know with diagrams um and again really why we we chose this project is because engineering students are often hands-on learners and this would be you know really something cool you can touch and feel and you can tweak it and that oftentimes that helps people to understand what's going on and lastly our major takeaway here for the kids, if they don't learn anything else, maybe we could drive home that science can be fun and interesting without being expensive. Um, you know, you can do all sorts of demos and fancy computers and stuff, but maybe kids can't relate to it unless they see it right in front of their face. One of the things we had to also decide on was different types of uh, design possibilities that we could do. You know, several times throughout this process, we we thought, you know, maybe just the engine's not going to be enough. We need to prove to the kids that you can actually convert this into some type of power. And that would, you know, that would drive them to maybe try and expand more on the project. Um, really, what we ended up finding was that just making the engine is a good first start. Uh, you see here, you could make a fan. You would just take the flywheel and add propellers. Uh, you know, work the same as any other fan. Or you could you know, drive a car with it, put some wheels on the bottom. Um, but for the sake of this project, there was too many variables that needed tweaking for that. And, you know, it just wasn't realistic. So we're trying to keep it in a realistic time frame here for the, the kids in the, the program. Uh, one other thing we thought about doing was an al alternate heat source to get more heat because with more heat, you would end up getting more power and thus getting into, you know, work a little better you'll see here what I'm talking about um, it really that's pretty simple you would just hook it up to a battery and put in a resistor here you see on the right and that would work like the same way as a toaster it would just you know create heat um, that you would end up putting under the can it would be more heat than you could get from a candle um, in the end we had to kind of just recommend that these ideas be expanded on for like a science fair or something it wasn't really realistic to put this in our project. Um, so then, you know, we actually had to get down and build 
our engine here. Um, so we started with the, I hope all you guys can see us, but we started with the pop can and ended up using like two and a half here to build our little cylinder. And uh, you got our, your displacer, which you can't really see from your seat, but it's, it's just steel wool wrapped around. And it's gonna provide something that slides up and down freely through the cylinder um, while also letting air pass on the outside. And um, you know, basically you got your cardboard frame here on the right, which just makes up the entire structure pretty much. And similarly, you got a flywheel and a crankshaft is like made out of a paper clip where you could use some, some thicker steel wire. And um, in the middle, this is the whole thing put together. And then from the side here, you can kind of see, you know, how you'll, it'll see better when it runs, but you can see all the different parts working. Um, lastly, once we got it finally put together, we, you know, we had to take pictures during the whole the whole uh, the build process but for the students we we wanted them to collect the materials themselves because I mean they're really cheap that's not that much to ask and um, after so we had to put that in their manual we had to also put the step-by-step -step directions and really make it clear you know what we wanted them to do so it would end up working out right and that, that took a lot of time making the pictures and diagrams and also like different troubleshooting points if, if you weren't getting your wheel to turn, what you could tweak and work on um, to hopefully get it there. And then similarly, for the teacher, you'll notice the packet's a little bit thicker if you guys want to take a look at it. We had to put in more of like a lesson plan because unfortunately, uh, you can't do a science project and it's just all fun. You gotta kind of drive a point home maybe. Um, so we just did a little introduction and like a, a lecture at the end which teaches you like your, you know, you go up your basic PV NRT equation and, you can kind of explain it to them that way. Um, really, it, just some critical thinking questions on, you know, if what went wrong, what you could do better, what you could change up, and you know, to get the result that you wanted. And lastly, here's our conclusion. We found that it, it would be a very good project because it was really inexpensive, and you know, this could be applied to any high school student, but specifically kids who don't have access to really cool computer programs and stuff, um, that will be really good because that's the target audience that we're, we're looking at. Um, unfortunately, it does take a lot of tweaking, but I mean, that's, that's part of the scientific process. Like, they, <laughs> there's no getting around that. Um, and some could say it's a bad thing, but we think it's a good thing because it will inspire the kids to work and critically think to you know, change some stuff up and try and fix whatever's going wrong. Um, lastly, you know, kind of, this is a simple way to explain how complex things work. All kids get in a car and their parents are probably driving to school and they don't even think about what's going on. You just turn the key and you go. Um, you know, there's a, there's a cool, you know, kind of satisfactory feeling when you can understand how systems work and, you know, why why you're actually getting power out of an engine like that. Um, you know, I said this was a good challenge for problem solvers, and we really think so. And it was definitely, it will definitely be a good exposure to kids for mechanical and dynamical systems. So. Thank you. That's what we have. So did you say we're gonna see a run? <laughs> so. I, I wish. Like, it says right here there's a lot of tweaking in the build phase, which is a problem that we ran into. Uh, when I first put it together, it I just got lucky and it started to run, but not reliably. Reliably, I didn't have it secured and it kind of tore itself apart. So in the rebuild, uh, we kind of got it to run for like 20 seconds, but not actually kind of catch, and kind of spent a long time tweaking it and. Kind of the premise is it'll go up and down and rotate this flywheel, and I'm actually getting it to go really well right now. Um, but usually, <laughs> um, this uh, diaphragm here will kind of catch and stop it from rotating, uh, so that's really limiting in getting it to work. But I did get it to work, just not right now. So.
So I love this idea. I'm going to build with the sum of what your direction is, which you already sent to me, I think. Um, but so do you think that the reason that it didn't run consistently was because you didn't have enough heat, or was it because these things were out of alignment, or not stiff enough, or, or do you even know? Um, I think it's one of the big things is a lack of met specific measurements. The instructables that Josh was talking about, it's it doesn't give specific measurements for kind of every single piece. Mm -hmm. And if you could kind of 3D print every piece, it would just be a lot more like an Ikea set where it's just put it all together. But it as it is, the tinkering is where wherein lies the problem. And just to add on to what he's saying, yeah. once we actually uh, do have the measurements sort of uh, a better feel for how they should be, uh, we can kind of lay those out on, on paper. So mm -hmm. it'll be a lot easier for the students to follow because they can just use Excellent. Cooler. So you could make little of, templates or something they could download? Yeah, yeah. So it'd be a lot easier for them to build one for us. Yeah. And, and are you planning to actually do that or are you all going to graduate? I'm not graduating yet. <laughs> <laughs> but honestly, that um, the dimensions and stuff, don't get us wrong, actually Nick did a ton of calculations and there's some pretty meaty technical details in our report. So that, that information's there, it's, it's the fine tuning of the project still, I think that we need. I have it. heard this is difficult. Yeah. It, uh, it's, it's a little tougher than we thought it would be. But. So is that, so maybe just to follow up on that, so you're trying to attract people to study STEM, right? Yes. So eight of you wonderful you know, engineering students, and this is not running, it's difficult, 20 seconds <laughs> run. Does this encourage me to come to STEM or discourage? I would, actually, I'll take this one. <laughs> <laughs> I think that if you've got a room full of students, I think there's a certain percentage of those students who will actually get it running. And I, I think that's pretty exciting. All the kids will want to see the one kid who got it running. Um, yeah. They'll want to see the engine. And I think that they'll take it home and try and work on it and make it run. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Unfortunately, we have different classes and stuff we also have to devote time to. But I mean, we were all in on this thing. We really did want it to run, you know. And I'd also like to say, I think some of the most rewarding experiences are the frustrating ones. And I think that those are some experiences that really get you interested. Sorry, thanks. Nice job. Yeah. Questions? Any, I'm sorry, any other questions from the crowd? I'm sorry. No, um, go ahead. Oh, first of all, I think this is awesome. It definitely interests me. Um, but secondly, do you know, like, I mean, you probably don't, like, how many horsepower it could generate? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Nick, man, yeah. he did that. It's actually. Well, there's a there's a complicated way to figure that out, and there's some easy ways to figure, easy ways to figure yeah. that out. There's actually uh, some spreadsheets online that are easily available. They make a few, <coughs> say, some module gas, things like that, and you can actually just put in things like uh, uh, the we call it the cold dead space that you sweep different things, different different uh, dimensions that you can measure, and it'll spit out how much power you generate, and that'll tell you what you can do. So, for instance, if you wanted to create a mobile like we showed earlier, yeah. you can find out how much power you have, you know, if that's enough to, uh, if that's enough to actually get going. Yeah, and I think that's very valuable, just the concept of power versus like energy is I think something a lot of high school students just aren't aware of, at least I wasn't until Absolutely. I yeah, there's a lot of really underrepresented concepts in uh, the lower education levels that I definitely like to hit. I think thermodynamics is something that's really interesting, but uh, it's not obvious how it's interesting until you start doing a project that uh, I also think that things like you know, linear momentum, uh, angular momentum are also interesting concepts. That, uh, you know, what we go through, like uh, Newton's equations of motion, things like that, we don't really get deep into those concepts and show how they're things. So, so do you believe that, you said high school, right? So, so do you mean juniors and seniors? I mean, who can deal with this in high school? Yeah. Juniors and seniors? Yeah, it pretty much is. When do you have your first physics class in high school? Uh, usually senior, right? Uh, uh, ju I would junior. say senior. My day was. Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's true. Yeah. What, you need <laughs> physics class? Wait, you don't I don't need think physics you class need to do this. You maybe need some some type of like shop class or something where you can think spatially and you know kind of design and work, but like we may you don't need an entire physics curriculum to like understand what's going on here. It's the important part is like putting your hands on it. 
and working with it. Well, they might need it for the math in your report. But yeah, I, I think just <laughs> well, that's the, the kind of general understanding of things like angular momentum, you don't really hit that until you have your first physics class. So yeah, that's right. kind of where I was coming from for that. So mm -hmm. you're right. essentially, I think what you're saying is, is that you could be a little lower level, they wouldn't learn as much, but they learn something. Yeah. And then at the high, if it went a little higher, you could get all these other ideas that you're bringing up. And, and I, I agree that this could be at the lower level um, university, don't you think? Oh, yeah. First, I don't know, mechanical engineering freshman, sophomore, whatever. I, it seems useful to me. Yeah. Well, I think so. I think it's kind of a dual level. Good question. <laughs> How long does that actually take you to build? Like, can you do this in one class? How many man hours? It, no. No. <laughs> no. Um, Total time. I, so one of the big limiting things is, so right here you've got this kind of bottle cap on the side, and you've got another one in the top here. Mm -hmm. And you're supposed to put ice water in the top, which and the flame on the bottom that creates the heat differential. So giving the epoxy its full recommended time to dry, so that you don't get any water flowing into the uh, displacer chamber, because Nick like, told me that that will actually make it explode. <laughs> uh, so that, that you're dealing with kind of six hours right there just to let the epoxy completely dry. So, and then assembling. Um, to just get all the pieces in place, you can probably do that in a couple days, but to get it actually working takes significantly longer. So is it like, like a maybe like a week-long project kind of thing, assuming the class period's it, up. Yeah, it would have to be on and off and, yeah. you know, a little bit of waiting. I would like to emphasize that templates will make these things go uh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. If, if all the pieces are pre-measured and just very specific, it would go a lot faster. It's the tweaking that really makes it uh, take longer. Okay, we're at time. Thank you very much. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um. <laughs> I hear you. Okay. So, Valerie, if you can stick by the microphone, that would be good. And um, of course, right here for the back and forth. Um, okay, that should do it. You're up. Go ahead and introduce yourself and then take off. Cool. Hello, I'm Valerie. I was the leader for Team 5. Um, we did a STEM education project. It's a circuit that incorporates both a little bit of electrical engineering, a lot of um, group communication. So, we'll run through an introduction. I'll show you what the project looks like, talk to you about our goals for the project, um, kind of the methods that we went about to build it, what we learned um, as a group from doing all of this. If we have time, we'll do a, a small demonstration, then we'll handle questions. So, put it into context. Um, we talked briefly about this in lecture, that there's a phenomenon with fireflies. Um, it happens in Southeast Asia. It happens here in Tennessee and one of the Carolinas, I think South Carolina. Um, at night, the fireflies come out, they start blinking. By the end of the night, they're all in sync with each other. Their lights go on and off at the same time. So we wanted to build a circuit that would emulate that. So it's going to require critical thinking on the students' parts. They're also going to have to learn how to switch, flip the switches on the circuit so that their LEDs come on at the same time, and go off at the same time. We were aiming for primary schools um, as far as the target age group. Per the UN Millennial Goals that we also talked about, the global primary school enrollment is up to 99%, which is amazing, and it's continually increasing over time. Um, so along the same lines, for international STEM, there's a push to get a common curriculum in effect to get everybody some sort of a STEM, uh, STEM educational background and exposure to that kind of technology, that kind of thinking, really breeds innovation. And so we wanted to shoot for that. Um, uh, one of the other things that we wanted to do was empower the students. 
both in terms of gender and as, as well as in terms of attracting them to the STEM education as it is. It can be a little bit overwhelming, it's a little bit scary, so we wanted to make something that was fun, that taught them how to communicate with each other, and that also introduced them at least to um, certain principles in the science and math industries. Um, there's also this push that we've talked about endlessly, I think this lecture, for a global sustainability. Along the lines of an international STEM curriculum, if we all have the same kind of background, the same sort of thinking, we'll be able to come together more on a global level and achieve that sustainability. So this is the inside of our circuit. It looks a little overwhelming, I think. So we had to take it down, make it a lot more intuitive than just staring at it, trying to figure out what the different wires were. So in terms of what we wanted to do for our project to make it worthwhile for our students, we wanted to allot a 60 hour time period. Students get the first 30 minutes to read through the manual to figure out how to put the circuit together. This uh, facilitates cooperation. They have to work together, they have to put it together, all that good stuff. Um, and then they'll have the second set of 30, 30 minutes to learn to cooperate in terms of flipping the switches on and off together. The the use of the word challenge is maybe not the best. We didn't want to make it competitive. That sometimes um, drives away from gender equality and empowerment. So we didn't want to do that. But the whole idea is to cooperate with each other, to talk to each other, to figure out how to flip your switches on and off, to figure out um, if you're out of sync, who's doing it, why is that happening, let's fix it. So we needed a voltage source. Um, true to science, we tried and failed. There were, we tried two different mechanisms. One was a small DC motor. It worked, but um, what happened was the friction uh, burned out the string that we were using to get it to turn. So that was useless. Um, we also tried a small other generator that we found on YouTube with cardboard and cranks and that was not gonna work either. I don't think it was gonna supply the correct amount of voltage to get the LEDs to turn on. So we found hand crank flashlights on the wonderful world that is Amazon. Um, on the left hand side, the red one, that's how it came packaged. On the right hand side is how we modified it to take the voltage away from the crank that goes to the flashlight's LEDs and to go to the quick connect terminals that are attached and secured with um, sufficient amount of electrical tape. Uh, so up here, top left, this is a circuit configuration from the outside of the box. All the switches have been turned to on. The three LEDs that are yellow are all on in accordance with the switches. The green LED serves as a sort of feedback. Um, that's how the students know that, oh, hey, we did it. Nice job. Um, and then on the bottom is the visual feedback to say, eh, somebody's not working with the team. And so with only one LED on, the green LED did not come on. Um, this is true if two switches were on and one were off, all the different combinations. So our goals for the project, we wanted to keep it below $50 for an entire classroom. We were keeping it to 32 students per class, allotting for eight groups, four per group, four students per group, um, three on the switches, one on the motor. We wanted this to have a minimal environment, environmental impact to keep with the idea of global sustainability. In using the crank flashlights, we were able to eliminate the need for a battery, so we made it, we took down its um, environmental in, impact. We also needed to make sure that this was age appropriate. Initially, we started for a K through five age range, and then a lucky consequence of putting it together, we have a lot of quick connects and a lot of wires. If you start with a younger age group, you just have it already connected for them, and they just learn to do the switches and cooperate in that fashion. As you get older, you can take it to higher levels of education and take away more parts so that they have to read the manual to learn how to put it together. So it's applicable among a different range of age, age groups. Um, it's also applicable domestically. You can take it internationally. <clears throat> and we also needed to make sure that it was durable. Um, I remember grade school, things were broken quite easily. So for the cost of our prototype, there down in the red you can see that it cost us $18.56. We uh, projected this further for a classroom of 32 students. To make eight of them, it would cost us $91.63. Um, 
well above what we wanted of, uh, as $50 for our target. We have spoken, however, to <coughs> Professor Anderson. She said, you know what, those are reusable parts. You can keep them year to year, 100 bucks, not that bad. So there's a little boost of confidence for the cost. <clears throat> In terms of conveying the message, we had to figure out how to make an instruction manual that would work across languages, across ages, all that fun stuff. Um, so we thought about using just a visual schematic. Not everybody in here is an electrical engineer. If you ever see one, they look scary. <laughs> <coughs> so that's not, that won't work. Uh, we thought about using a tabular format. So this LED connects to this wire, connects to this, connects to this switch, da 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 da. It's also a little bit overwhelming. It's not universally intuitive. Not everybody could look at it and make sense from it. We could write it in words, word for word instructions. You run into language barriers. That wasn't ideal. We decided to pursue pictures alone. This was a challenge. I think it's inherent to that. Um, we opted for following the instructions that come with Legos. There aren't any words, it's just pictures, but they're very clear, they're very explicit, they're very color coded. Uh, so for the challenges faced, like I said, we had to come up with an instruction manual that had a coding system that was intuitive and survived different ages and different language barriers. Um, we also needed to make sure that this empowered students. It attracted them to STEM. It also empowered um, the girls in the class, to be fair. Because there is a heightened sense of competitiveness that can steer the girls away. So we have to make sure that they, uh, they feel equal. So, like I said, here are some of our sample instructions. Absolutely. So this is what the uh, inside of the board for our circuit looks like. They're labeled alpha, alphanumerically, LED 3, 2, and 1. There's positive and negative terminals. The switches are S1, S2, S3, and here's LED 4. Um, the switches also have their own kind of terminals attached to them, <coughs> different wires. So that would be the first picture, and then you would go to these. There's a quick connects that go on either end of the wires. These are also color-coded. Um, one end of the wire has the pink that's on the left, and the connection is on the right-hand side, and it's color-coded red. And then for each component and each switch, um, you can see that it tells you what, con what terminal on the switch to connect to what end of the resistor. Same for the LED, and then the LED gets put to ground. So, for our lessons learned, um, trade-offs are inherent to engineering. You can't really avoid them. You have to decide what's priority and what's not. Um, we also had to, it, initially our goal was to teach some principles of electrical engineering. We wanted to teach them about parallel construction. We wanted to teach them about serial construction. All these fun things that we get super excited about as EEs. We learned that you can't really do that. That's a lot for anybody to learn in half an hour. So really, just teach them to active learning, teach them to have fun, to cooperate. Um, also, one drawback with our switches, they switch on and off. So if they're all on at the same time, you can just turn the motor, the lights come on. So we wanted to, rather than have just on and off switches, we wanted to have push buttons so that it was a little bit more engaging. Um, we also learned that cooperation is hard. Uh, it's hard to learn it, it's even harder to teach it. We're a group of 10 people getting schedules together for all of that, getting everybody to communicate, getting everybody on the same page. It was a challenging. We did it, we survived, it's totally doable. Um, we also learned that we have to uh, consult with local experts. We didn't know the best approach, we didn't know the best option for what project to do, we didn't know if this was actually age appropriate or not, so we had to talk to other people about it. So there you go. Okay, um, before we clap, do you want a demo? Yeah. So, so once you pick, uh, how many people? Three. I need four people: two ladies, two gentlemen. Uh, I think you should. So I think I have right one of here. each. Right yeah. here. I volunteer. <laughs> All right. You do too. Who else? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Anybody Anyone? else? How cooperative. So we need one man and one woman. Okay. All right, Aaron. Somebody else. A woman. All right, great. Do you want me to snap off a, a movie in this? Probably not. Absolutely. Put it on the it's website. It's going to go on your report. <laughs> Just a second. Okay. So this is the generator. 
You just hold it and crank it. It works like that. Everybody else. Wait, you guys have to switch your switches on and off simultaneously for it to work. Um, Are we supposed to do it in a rhythm? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, we wanted to also kind of incorporate like local music mm -hmm. or a metronome or something to kind of keep the beat. Mm -hmm. One, to make it a little bit more interesting, and two, to kind of give them a tempo. But so we should start with them off, right? Yeah, so they should all be okay. off. Okay. I'll grab my switch. All right. Switch. And then... Okay, so all off now. So then all together you would go on, and all together you would go off. Okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Okay, we're in sync. You're covering up the green LED. Alright, it's on. Hey, somebody get out of sync there, Aaron. Come back. How hardy are these switches? Yeah, they're like, <laughs> wearing them in a little bit. Alright, thanks. Got the generator over here. Alright, questions? and it's on one of your slides. This picture here, there's no words here at all, but it's painfully obvious that this picture is gonna mean this. I thought that was really nice. Thank you. Yeah. Good work. Did that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have the instructions, but for the LED, um, is, it, is there an anode and cathode? Does it matter how this ends? Are they gonna be installing the LED themselves or is this something that you're just giving them and they're doing the... So it would depend on the age group, um, probably the higher up ones. Would they be, is that fair to say that they could do it themselves, I think? Yeah, it's it's in the instructions. It, 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 it matters because it's clear. AC coming out of the generator. So it, um, the three LEDs run off the uh, positive wave and then the, the third one, or I'm sorry, the fourth one actually is on the um, bottom half cycle of the waveform. So it's, the, the overall circuit diagram is kind of That's not in here, this is just how to build it. Yes. So, so your main recommendation would be, you feel like you should replace the switch with a button. Is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Can you repeat why? Because when all the switches are on, you can just run the generator. So it doesn't require anybody to do anything. So it's not hard to cooperate is what you're saying. Yeah. You think it's harder with a button? Yes. What it, it, <clears throat> I see. But the people, see, you have to be able to see everybody else's lights to be able to sync. Right. Clearly. Or at least one other light. You don't have to see them all. You've got to just see one, right? You have to see two. Your own? Well, you have to see the other two people, right? No. Fireflies don't do that. They can't see all the way across the river. They only look at their neighbors okay. because that's all they can look at. Fair. It still works. Okay. That's, that's really tricky, actually, that why it works because of that. But, so let's worry, not worry about that issue, but let's say you can see all the lights. Okay. But I guess is the concern that you can see the switches too, because if everybody just flips it up, then you're done. Right. So, so is there another way though besides a, but you can see a button too, so is there a way to make it so that you control the rate and not the on off? See what I mean? Because I think if you can control the rate. The rate of the switching or the rate of the blinking? Well, the rate of the switching. Okay. Is there a way to do that? And I'm truly asking. I mean, I don't see. It's not easy. On like a human level? Yeah, like if you could control some way with your hand the rate of the switching, not whether it's switching per se at an instant. Switch, 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 switch. But I can, it starts switching and you could control fast switching versus slower switching and get it to sync. Because that's actually what happens in a lot of distributed synchronization problems. You control the rate, not the blink. And in fact, the Firefly probably is doing that. That would Maybe? Re it would require another circuit, right? <laughs> it's not obvious. No, not I think it's a time question. I would have predict that um, that would be a lot more difficult because you'd have to have like, several other pieces of it. And so also maybe that that's one of the ways to look at it going into maybe an order project. Sure, project. good answer. Yeah. At a university level, um, you would probably use a 555 timer for your ECDs, right? Yeah, the comment, you could, 
you can double the group, so have six people instead of three, and then say you had buttons or switches and they're turned around and they have a communicator that's looking at the lights. So then you have someone telling you how that, like when to switch your light, but you can't see the lights and you have to go. Uh -huh. So that would, that would add delay to too. make it more. Or if you made it so that each person can see their light and the one to their right in a circle, it would be more firefly-like. Sure, that was also something that we had talked about, was taking it from everybody get it to work as a group, yeah. now let's make it a really big circuit, uh -huh. we'll all work together as a classroom. Uh -huh. cool. And also we thought about different ways of human feedback, so mm -hmm. you've got all your senses, right? Mm -hmm. So one idea would be to blindfold everybody mm -hmm. and just have to hear, uh -huh. or you know, not just let them hear, but just make them visually have feedback to coordinate. So that would be another, another way you could implement the challenge. <coughs> So you said if all three switches are on and the generator has been pumped, it works like it's perfect so the green light's on, it says they're in sync full time. Um, you could think about adding a few capacitors so that it's only green for like a like part of a second after the switch. Yeah. So that if they're all on after like a half second or something, the LED goes off, that way they have to be continuously going back and forth. Yeah. Lots of ideas. <coughs> I mean, you'd probably do this without technology too, right? I mean, that's one of the things. And maybe it'd be a nice way to start with children. Um, for instance, right now, if we all tried to sync <coughs> our clapping for you as we we could do it, right? I think so. Well, let's do it. <laughs> By I, all think, means. I think time's up. Okay. <laughs> Good job. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you very much. Can you thank oh, Professor Grace? <laughs> He's got to run. Okay. Um, uh, we said El Salvador is up, right? Yep. Do you guys mind if I fire your TV? Sure. Go. Sure. Focus on that. I will. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> okay, so Aaron, um, two things. Try to stick near the microphone, and here's your back and forth. Okay. All right, you're up. All right, hi guys. My name's Aaron. Um, I worked with, uh, I believe, seven other people sitting all over in those two rows. Um, and we worked on a rainwater collection system. So just some background on this. Um, water is obviously a really big problem, particularly access to clean water. So that's 70, 738 million statistics that's probably something you've seen before, probably in this class. Um, and it's not that they don't have access to water, it's water is contaminated. You don't want to drink it. It's really hard to do anything productive with it. Um, I have a couple um, figures down there, two liters per day and 20 liters per day. So two liters per day, which is one of these guys, um, that's how much Physiolog physiologically you should drink per day. I mean, I look at this, I probably, I feel like I don't drink this much, but I don't know, it's hard, it's hard to keep track. Um, 20 liters per day, that's a statistic we got from the World Bank. Um, the World Bank says 20 liters of water per day is enough for consumption and to do any other sorts of things you need to do, wash your wash clothes, sanitation needs, and basically just like, it, it used the phrase like, keep your dignity as a human being. So we chose a region in Central America. Um, El Salvador is the country. Um, there's just some statistics on it. Um, low is 64, so if you can imagine, like, I probably don't drink two liters per day here, but if I lived there where it got up to 89.6 and the low is only 64, I'd probably drink a lot more. Mm -hmm. um, so they have two, two, uh, two seasons, pretty much, drain, uh, dry season, rainy season. Um, they're each six months. Um, so, and here's also an interesting statistic. It's 
says, so families who don't have access to water, like you can't just turn on a tap there, they spend approximately like 8.5% of all their time getting water. So this, if you do the simple math, it's about two hours per day. So if you could imagine two hours out of every day just to get water that might not even be clean. So that's pretty, pretty significant. Um, how we chose the particular region, um, it's actually a municipality inside of San Pedro Puxta, Puxtila. Um, it's called Las Palitas. Um, David on our team actually traveled there with Engineers Without Borders and worked on a trip there. Was it one year or just twice? It was twice. It was twice. He went down there twice. So he's familiar with the region. Um, and I don't know if I asked you this, but I saw online before that it was actually most of the people living there were relocated after a landslide and Las Palitas actually used to be like a landfill. Yeah. So, yeah, so I found that pretty interesting. Um, okay, so we identified this problem, we identified our regions, what are we going to do about it? So, obviously we need something that works there to get them water so they can drink clean water and use water for things they need to do every day. Um, and so it doesn't take up two hours of their day every day. That could be spent like getting food or working or something else, even sleeping. Um, so here's just some set criteria for our whatever we came up with. Obviously, um, things like cost and simple. Uh, standalone's one that's not as intuitive. We, we figured standalone because, I mean, they have all different types of uh, shelters there. Roofs aren't always reliable for, let's say, collection. If that's what you wanted to do. They most likely don't have gutters. Um, so we wanted something sustainable. We don't want to put in a pump and or put in something and have it break after a year. Then it's just just money that was sunk. Um, something very low maintenance. Something they don't really have to think about during the day. It just doesn't take them. Just doesn't take up any of their time. Um, and then obviously available local material so they can actually build it. Um, this figure, actually, um, this kind of led us to kind of our initial design. Um, so we just looked at the region. This is their rainfall, and that's actually, it adds up to about 174 centimeters of rainfall, for, rainfall per year. That's actually a pretty significant amount. So we kind of decided to take advantage of that because Rain coming from the sky, I mean, you're not going to have any dirt in it, typically, um, as long as the collection surface it lands on is clean. So we said, hey, let's take advantage of that. So we first, we kind of wanted to think about just how are we going to collect this rain? Let's, how, what are we going to make to collect it that they could make there? So we came up with a couple different designs. Um, the first one in the top right there was kind of a mechanical like fold out based off of like a crank umbrella that you see like above a table. You kind of crank it out and we're like, yeah, that's easy to open and close. You can close it so it doesn't get dirty, birds don't poop on it, that sort of thing. Um, then design two, I don't, I don't really know what we were thinking. It was like a slidey, very complicated, but it's like, okay. So, um, but really what we got from this is we need something that's, simple and we need something that can stay clean that you could like cover or something just so it doesn't get dirty um so then the next part is once you collect the water you got to store it so storage tanks um they're pretty expensive um but we we wanted something that was inert and polyethylene it's durable inert it's available in developing countries if you've ever been to you'll see big black tanks that's typically what they're made out of um and we figured in terms of keeping the thing sealed, we'll have a we'll have an inlet pipe and we'll have a shutoff valve, which is what you see in the top right corner, the, the white PVC with the red handle. And then like on the bottom of it somewhere we can have we can have a hose bib so you can turn that and actually get access to the water. Um, so storing water, stagnant water is not a good thing. So if you just have like pond water. You don't want to drink that, that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. So like mosquitoes lay eggs in there, you have parasites, that sort of thing. It's gross. Um, so that's especially why we want to seal it. But even just sealed water can, can grow like bacteria in it. So the Ethiopia group really already talked about this a lot, but so does filtration. It's something you can utilize. 
Um, so our, our, once we collect the water, it'll, you can have it sitting there for, we, we'd say like probably they're gonna get all their rainfall in the rainy season and none during the dry season, so up to six months. So once it comes out, if you need to use it for some of your two liters per day to drink, then you do sodas filtration. Um, pretty easy, four steps there. Um, so just to see if this thing would actually kind of work or sustainable or how big to make it. So the, the, these were all lots of questions we had. Um, so first let's talk about the size of this thing. So like, okay, two liters per day, like that's not a lot. Like multiply that by 365, okay, it's kind of a lot. What about 20 liters per day? Multiply that by 365, 7,300. I didn't do that in my head. I knew that, but <laughs> it's, it's a lot of water. So we, it's like, how big of a collection surface do you need? So we made, a, we made a MATLAB program that we just put all the math equations in. It kind of just spit out, a, it was obviously just a linear trend. Um, on the x-axis here, you can see liters of water required per person per day for one person. Um, and in the code you enter, like, you enter, like, I want 20 liters of water per day. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And then on the y-axis, the surface area needed to maintain that. So as you can see here, to keep 20 liters per day, um, you're going to need a surface area of 4.65 meters squared. So it's about so about a little under two meters by two meters. And here you can kind of see a better representation of how big that would be. So about like eight feet by what is this? Eight feet by eight feet two inches would be a collection surface. So all right, anyways. Our final design, we kind of incorporated all those different aspects we really focus on, which is collection, and storage, and just kind of the dimensions, like how big to make this thing. <coughs> um, so as you can see here, we have like a total cost of all this. The storage tank seems like a lot of money, but when you do the actual math, what we were aiming for was one to three cents per liter. Um, so, the thing, depending on how long it lasts, and it should be pretty sustainable. I mean, it's a pretty, pretty simple system. Um, so you can see after, if it lasts 10 years, then you're down to a cent per liter. So, and this is more of something that like a group would go in and put in, like kind of like a pump. Like the African people don't just come out of nowhere and say, I'm gonna put in a pump. Like, a group travels down there and pays for it and puts it in. This is $700 is very reasonable compared to like how much a pump would cost. Um, <clears throat> so the main thing with this is it provides them with not only drinking water, but it's very flexible in terms of how much amount, like if you, ha if you can afford a bigger surface, then you can get more water. So it's very versatile. You don't have to have specific dimensions. Um, all right. Questions. Any questions? I was going to do a quick little almost demo. Um, it's pretty simple. We built this model here. Um, in the actual model, the tank would be a lot bigger and kind of centered under it. But basically, here's our collection surface. And we've got a gutter that's angled down here into our, into our reservoir polyethylene tank. We've got our code bib and our shutoff valve. Nothing too rain. exciting. <laughs> Simulating rain here, but yeah, so there you go. <laughs> Pretty exciting. I, I can do more if you guys want. <laughs> <laughs> I figured. Yeah. So I'm curious, you, you had said that rainwater is generally clean, um, but the collection surface might have issues. So. I guess um, in some countries I've been to, this um, there's a lot more sort of dirt in the air or something as a, just par particulates, mm -hmm. pretty massive. It's sort of unbelievable. Um, you know, you you come out, you, it's on the surfaces, things and so forth. So I guess I'm trying to get a sense of how 
often you'd have to clean the roof that this is I mean that it seems yeah, like it's yeah. hard. And th yeah, that's definitely a legitimate concern. It's also even a legitimate concern, not even on the collection surface, but if you've got dust blowing around, it's gonna get in the rain before. Um, so basically the situation in Las Politas is they're getting their water from a very contaminated river, obviously, so it used to be a landfill. So I mean there's water runoff taking what used to be a landfill and also they don't have sanitation or running water sanitation. So human excrements, animal excrements, putting it in this river and that's what they use all their water for. So um, there's no, I mean I don't know how windy, how much dirt it'll kick up. Hopefully you'll put it in a more grassy area to kind of reduce that. But um, this thing's not really, I mean, I'm like 6'3". The highest point at this model is 6 foot. Um, and you can even have the angle a little bit less. You don't need it angled that much. Um, so it, it wouldn't take more than just wiping it down. It shouldn't take too long. Um, so if I, if I have a shelter of some sort with a typically a corrugated roof, corrugated steel roof. Um, so what I'm wondering is if there's, there's a way to use your own roof of your own house that you're living in to feed into the system also. Or is there that mm -hmm. unnecessary because the feed rate's fast enough off of that size roof? Yeah, the feed rate's fine off of this size roof. Um, it's just, we, I talked about the standalone issue because obviously like there's plenty of rainwater collection systems off of roofs, but all of them have problems with filtration because a lot of people, some roofs are typically higher than six foot. I mean, obviously it depends in the developing country, but um, this thing's just a lot easier to clean. It's just a heck of a lot easier to construct than say a house with a metal roof. Yeah, but if you've already got a house with a metal roof, does that roof need to be over your water tank, I guess is the no. question. No, so essentially it's just, yeah. It's just, just, so you could just add on a tank to could, someone's yeah. roof. Yeah, so you could just, yeah, you could add a, sort of tank like this it's just you have the issue with like if you want to put with this we have a little tarp like you want to put a tarp over your roof to try and keep it extra clean we just once again great demonstration <laughs> so. now no dust we'll put some rocks there because that's only what four foot eight you can reach up there um it's just it's a lot easier to maintain and if you don't have a roof like um, I believe David said a lot of them didn't have that sort of roof. Um, and if they did, it just wasn't set up with a gutter system. They're, they're also, like, down there, at least in Las Palitas, a lot of the houses are built, like, right underneath, right next to trees, and mm -hmm. it's in a ravine, so access to the, you know, rainfall from the roof is not going to be as much as if it was in a standalone thing that was outside in the open, and exposed, and it would collect more rain that way. But that's just down in Las Palitas, so that's, that's like, mm -hmm. region-specific. Well, it gets that hot, I'd put my house under a tree. Yeah. <laughs> you have scaled this model for like 20 meters a day. Mm -hmm. um, and you keep like talking about dimensions, but how would that scale change if you're discussing, you should probably have at least 40 meters a day because you're saving, if you're using it that day, and then also anticipating saving for the dry season, and also families of more than one person. Yeah. So that's what's the scale of it? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, so you don't need to pull up here. I didn't talk about these much, but Tyler's the one who did all this. Actually, way. go back to this. This model um, was scaled for a family of four that, uh, with these dimensions for the surface area of the roof, would collect your rainwater throughout the rainy season, uh, that you could uh, drink water from it throughout the year. So these simulations show, um, the graph on the top right shows like simulated rainfall for a five year period. And the graph on the bottom left shows <coughs> uh, water use for a five year period, either the red line shows like if a person's trying to use just 20 liters of water a day, and the blue line is if they're um, using it flexibly so they can use more or less depending on how much they've collected. Uh, but this system that we designed here um, works for a family of four for multiple years. And that's the simulation show that uh, with the surface area of this, um, it'll collect enough rainfall uh, for them to use reliably. Yeah. Like if you, if you leave it out, like is that stainless steel or is that something? Well, so this is 
the idea was this is roofing material. So this is material that they'd use for the roof anyway. Um, so it should be more resistant to rust. I don't, I mean, I don't, I don't know exactly what it is. David had first, you had first hand experience. I mean, I've seen it before. They use it as roofs, like even in Guatemala when I went, but. I mean, like if you leave them out, they are, they generally get pretty nasty and early. Part of that is that it'll rust. So is there any type of like. Are you talking about the rust going into the water supply? Yeah. Or like, I mean, because if the sheet that you're, sorry, the sheet that you're collecting water rusts, mm -hmm. then, I mean, you're going to end up with all types of nasty, rusty particles sure, in your sure. water. Sure, sure. Um, so, most of, most of the countries I've seen, like, most of the Europeans end up uh, zinc, not metal. Oh. So, if you use metal, like, it's just going to get rust. Like, even, like, if there is no, like, rainfall in there, it's just going to get rust, like, Built like the atmosphere. Right. So that most of those are made up of zinc. Okay. So they have zinc material. Yeah. A metal there that doesn't. Yeah. Work. So I worked in a hardware store for three years. Um, typically, like any fasteners you get screws, they're typically like zinc coated steel or something. Steel something that rusts. Zinc really doesn't. It doesn't reduce as readily. So I and like I said, I don't exactly know. That's why I didn't want to say. I don't exactly know what these materials are. But I mean, if they're using them for roofs already, I assume there's zinc coating or some sort of corrosion resistant thing on top of it. Um, but in terms of like, yeah, little debris getting in there. So on this, we actually, I don't know if I talked about it. There's actually a, it's hard to see. There's a screen over the gutter. Um, so there's going to be a screen over the gutter. And we talked about like in the inlet, like kind of just having like a little, little maybe mesh or just wire thing to get any smaller debris. I mean, but if you keep it clean, there shouldn't be a lot of debris. Um, it's a cha that, that's a behavioral thing. We'd have to talk to people who live there, like there's someone who knows their culture better. Are they, are they gonna be willing to put in the time? Because it's not gonna take two hours a day. But I mean, it is gonna take some time, maybe just even just looking it over every day to make sure there's not a layer of dust that built up or something. Uh, yeah. Instead of just a screen, uh, why would like the first group talked about, the whole water filtration system, why don't you have kind of like a cartridge that could slide in that would filter it out into the into the giant vat of water. That way you wouldn't have to worry about wiping it down so much. You would just need to worry about cleaning the filter. Yeah, so we were just trying to really focus on materials that were readily available there. And our I, idea was like, if they put in the work, because they, they're, they're getting two hours more per day um, than like, we just kind of said maybe just throw in a screen because like they probably have that around. That's pretty aluminum screening. It's a pretty common thing. Um, but yeah, there, this the thing about this design is this: if you go down to a certain country, you're not you're not going to build exactly this. I mean, it depends what's available. Obviously, yeah, that would be a lot better. Um, the type of fil filter you need isn't going to be that great. There's not going to be that much to filter out. But but yeah, I mean, you could definitely add on something like that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, Team Nicaragua. Dr. Basano, I need to go to my chemistry final. Oh, yeah, sure. So. Okay. Who did extra credit for drinking this, right? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, each presenting? Yep. Okay, so stay close here so they can hear you and here's your back and forth. Wonderful, thank you. All right, so I'll let them um, kind of start doing the filter here, but my name is Alex and we, um, we're team one and we have some water for Chinandega. Um, I had the pleasure of going to Chinandega for a couple days um, this past May and that's actually one of the pictures that um, I took with the group there. So <laughs> we'll let that happen on the side, but um, welcome to Chinandega. Chinandega is a dump in the northwestern corner of Nicaragua. So it's, it, it's right in the heart of Central America. And as you can imagine from the last group talking, El Salvador is right um, to the northwest of that. It's very hot and it's very humid. Chinandega exists because of poverty in that Chinandega was a city with a dump 
and then there was a hurricane, Hurricane Mitch in 98, and a lot of the people from the surrounding areas were displaced, and they live now in Chinandega in what is known as the Circle of Death. The Circle of Death is a, uh, the area between a cemetery, um, a wastewater treatment center that leaks a lot, and then a dump. Now, it's really important that I use the word dump and not landfill, because a landfill is engineered. A landfill um, is engineered to maintain everything that's put into it um, so that it decomposes the right way that it's supposed to and that no contaminants are released. A dump is a dump. Um, things are just thrown into it. If it's a nice dump, uh, there might be a hole in the ground so that things are thrown in and that you don't see a mound, but that hole is actually worse because that allows for better, more seepage, it's not better, um, more seepage of contaminants into the water. So why are we worried about the water? Well, these are the EPA's um, list of contaminants that might be found in groundwater near uh, dumps. So in the green, we have some microorganisms that might be in the water. The red is inorganic materials. So these are things from uh, mainly electronic waste. We know that everyone in developing countries has cell phones, um, and they just throw them away. And then the blue is things like nitrates and um, dioxin, and that's mainly from fertilizers. So we know that the EPA um, is a US standard um, government, but we thought it would be some good uh, guidelines to go by for filtering our water. And so why are we worried about unfiltered water? Well, if you look at this graph, it shows how Nicaraguans get their water. So the blue is the urban population. So that's about half the pop total population in Nicaragua. And you can see that half of them get their water from inside the house, and the other get, get it from outside in the field. And then the tan is the rural, rural population, excuse me. And you can see it's a little more spread out, but they mainly get it from outside in the field, public and private wells, and then natural springs. So if you add that all together, that's three-fourths of the population that's getting contaminated water. So our main question was, how do we cheaply and effectively um, improve water quality? So you could go in and you could add a bunch of chemicals and chlorine to water, but that wouldn't be cheap. You could go in and make uh, wastewater treatment facilities that's not cheap either, and it's also not easy. So we looked at what they had around them, and one of the main attractions to Chinandega is the dump. So we looked at what we could make with that. So as you can see, we have our design over here, um, and it uses pretty much all recycled materials. Um, it's a little hard to see the different layers in our prototype, but if you look at the schematic that we have here, um, you'll see that each layer is separated by cloth or fabric. We used an old t-shirt. And then it has alternating layers of sand, charcoal, and bone char. So you might be thinking, why in the world would I want to drink water that has been through dirt and charcoal and bone? <laughs> um, so I'll explain that the sand um, can be found really easily in Chinandega. It's pretty close to the ocean, so the top layer of the ground is going to be mainly sand. And that's going to take out things like uh, copper. The, the heavy materials are the larger particles. Um, and any dirt or things that you might have found outside, like our water is filtering right now. Uh, the charcoal is the same charcoal that they're going to use to make their food. So it's a material that they already have. All you need to do is just crush that up and then uh, compact it as much as possible. And that acts as a carbon filter. The same thing that you have in your Brita filter in your fridge right now. And then the bone char, I'll clarify that it is animal bone. Um, we had a lot of uh, discussion about that. But it's the same, <laughs> <laughs> same uh, bone char and basically charcoal that um, you would be using when, you, uh, when they kill their animals um, to, to eat. So it's already a material that they have um, ready. And that actually takes out a lot of the heavy metals um, that it would be really toxic to um, the people in the area. So as we're talking about this design, we know that we took out um, a lot of the inorganic and like the heavy metals. Um, but like a lot of the other groups have talked about before, we also looked into the SOTUS method. Um, and so that is aimed at taking a look at all of the microorganisms that are in the water. So once it goes through the mechanical filter, we also have a uh, plastic bottle. Um, interestingly enough, in Nicaragua, they don't have two liter bottles. They have three and 3.1 liter bottles, um, which it's really strange. I can actually like tell the difference just visually looking at them because I worked with them so much when I was down there. Um, but it's really important for the SOTUS method that you have a clear bottle um, so that the light can penetrate that. Um, and then you put it in there for about six hours, 
and it is 99.9% .9 free of all the bacteria that we were worried about. So when we did our research, um, we noticed that one of the things that it took out was E. coli, salmonella, um, things like the rotavirus, and then Giardia, um, a parasite that's really common in Nicaragua, um, one that plagues a lot of the children in the area. And we know how devastating that can be to their education um, and the poverty trap that is there. So let's look at the cost. Um, it's easy to use, and um, we know that it's probably easy to make, but it's also very cost effective because we're upcycling most of these materials. So the only thing, if you'll notice, that might um, cost a little bit of money is the reflective surface that would be needed for the SOTUS method. Um, but like we have talked about with a lot of the other groups, um, a lot of the roofs in the area are corrugated metal, and it's a really gray area for someone to just set something up top. It gets it out of the area um, a little bit raised so that there's less shade. Um, and it can be more effective. So let's look at the production and usability. We know that um, to really have an effective technology, it needs to engage the entire population. So uh, typical of tin and dega, the men already pick the dump. That's one of the main things that they do there. They uh, pick it for scrap metal, they pick it for anything that's useful, and they already pick out a lot of the bottles. So we can use the bottles we can use the um, bone char and the charcoal that they already produce. So the men are produ providing the materials. The children can actually make this filter. We made this in 20 minutes. Um, and I know it doesn't look pretty, but it doesn't have to look pretty. It just has to work. And then the women and children are going to be the main users of this. So it really engages the entire population. Um, we did some uh, schematics of how well it would work. So it filters at about five ounces per minute. Um, which is the same as your Brita water filter in your refrigerator, and it's about four pounds. So a child um, could easily use this. The environmental impact, we know that we want to make this sustainable, so we really looked at upcycling most of our materials, which we've already talked about. Um, but the charcoal, the fabric, and the bottles, those would be materials that would just be laying around unused, so we're upcycling them. Um, and we're also looking at minimal excess emissions. So you might not necessarily be burning your animal bones, um, so that's the one added effect that we have on this process. Um, and then it's also reusable. So the only uh, maintenance that you really have on this filter is replacing the bottle. Um, for the SOTUS method, it re recommended that you change it about every six months. And then for the mechanical filter, you definitely want to change the top layer of sand. Um, every few uses to make sure you get out all the particulates that are in it. So implementation. Um, we looked at implementing it in two different ways. We looked at on a household scale and then on a community level. So I'll talk about the household scale first. It's a little easier to keep track of the UV and the UVA uh, radiation for the SOTUS method, SOTUS method um, because you're not, you definitely know what your family has put into it. Um, so you can keep more track of the six hours of sun radiation that it's getting. And then you can also tell for the maintenance of the mechanical filter. Um, there's just a lot more accountability for yourself. For the community level, um, if you were to implement this on a community level, you would want to go to the leaders of the community, especially the women, because they're the ones that are getting most of the water. And then you definitely want to make sure that you're replacing that top layer of sand that we talked about before. Scaling up. Uh, we know that this design was made for one specific community, Chinandega, but there are thousands of dumps around the world. Um, and the reason that it would work in Chinandega is the reason that it would work in many other places. It's easy to use, it's easy to make, and it's cheap. Um, so if you have any questions, I think Blake might be the one to uh, drink some of our water. We <laughs> filtered the, <laughs> the water the other day, um, and we did put it on my roof, um, which is kind of like a tin roof. Um, so, Blake, if you're willing. Okay, I trust you. <laughs> <laughs> you. You did put it on the roof? Yes. What was, what are you filtering? You're not, what, what, before you train, just say. Okay, so, <laughs> <laughs> so the water that we put in was full of dirt, and then we, you might have seen a little bit of mix-up that caused a big spill, and some of the dirt actually got in the bottom of this bottle. Oh, yeah, but, but d where's the dirty water coming from? Is that from the river? Oh, no, this was, I just went and got dirt from outside. Of the <laughs> so right now we're just showing mainly the um, turbility that um, the first group talked about, um, but we know that it does filter out a lot of the particulates. <laughs> 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 <It's like water. laughs> okay, hold on a second. How's it taste? 
Really? Not much different from what's in my bottle right there. Really? No, not, not, not at all. Yeah. It's pretty good. Um, I would recommend chilling it. Doesn't taste gritty. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Okay, but um, are you going to email everybody and tell us if you got set? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, wow. Interesting. I'm sick, I guess. <laughs> Impressive. Yeah, so we're open for questions. The rest of the group wants to come up. So, you know, do you have to sit there and hold that? <laughs> well, so we discussed this right now, yes, like it's five ounces a minute, you sit there and hold it, I mean, you let go, it's balanced well, but uh, we discussed kind of further things, like you could build a stand that you would actually have a bottle under it, and then you would put the top bottle, which is actually the filter, on the stand, so you wouldn't have to sit there for 10, 15 minutes and actually hold the bottle there and stabilize it. Well, and it wouldn't even have to be necessarily a bottle that's collecting it, whatever they use to collect your water, you can just like over top of it, it be well, I know there's nothing like on top of that, so if a kid knocks it over, the wind blows it over, mm -hmm. it over but it's you should it. always make it some sort of stand, but yeah. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay, so even though the I mean, you just drank it, it still looks a little bit gnarly. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, this doesn't look nearly as good as it did when we ran it on wind. Day. Have you tried <laughs> running it through twice? Like mm -hmm. another yeah, we have that yeah. helps. That's so, what we did for yeah. this one. We ran it through uh, one and a half times for this one. But could we do a little? <laughs> Some of it we ran through. Yeah. 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 Be more technical <laughs> about what's there than gnarly. Or tastes okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, if Professor Abreu is, is here. He probably I don't know what he would have said about drinking it. Because mm -hmm. I mean, he's an expert on you know the microbial level. Mm -hmm. uh, Things that you might find in taking a handful of, uh, of dirt. <laughs> uh, you know, there's an old saying when my kids drop their food on the floor and they pick it up and eat it, you say, well, little Ohio dirt never hurt anybody. But this is taking this to another level. <laughs> but uh, so you, it, what I'm trying to ask, maybe I should ask it more carefully. Have you, have you done some scientific analysis on? The output um, contamination levels are the R oh. specific though that we have not. Okay, so but you do know about the sodas. Mm -hmm. yeah. And re yeah, re I mean, through all the research we did, it exactly like said ninety nine point nine percent got rid of everything. Yeah, I mean that's what raises your confidence to take the drink, right? Yeah, there, I mean, right. We all did our research and they did a good job with it. And I wasn't there, so. <laughs> that's why he had it because he wasn't on our team. <laughs> <laughs> that was the punishment. It sounds like a faculty meeting. Just <laughs> <laughs> ask if you guys considered. Um, to me, it's a little disconcerting. Where they get their material from the dump, so it's going to be contaminated and dirty. And they're going to be using that to pull and help treat their water. Mm -hmm. So the main materials that are actually used in the filter aren't going to necessarily be from the dump. So a lot of the materials are going to be kind of self-cleaning. If that makes sense. Are you confident that's 30 MTU uh, turbidity for the soda stacks to be effective, not to make you panic or anything? <laughs> <laughs> this is a lot worse. Well, that's that not. Yeah. Yeah. Even that one looks, I mean, it's yeah. pretty close. That looks more. Mm -hmm. And that's something that we could like, maybe collaborate with. Yeah. Um, you have a great design. Yeah. Uh, one more thing to note, though, is that well, we're using a one and a half liter or two liter bottle. Mm -hmm. um, their bottles are actually like a pretty good chunk more because as uh, Alex was saying, they have three and 3.1 liter bottles. So our layers had to be a little thinner for this one um, than they would be for the actual, like we couldn't find a three and a half, or three, three and 3.1 liter bottles here. Um, but those layers would be a little bit thicker, which would really help out, um, maybe make it not as close to the turbidity. Uh, yeah, just kind of to affirm what you guys are doing, I, I know for a fact that that works because I've used exactly that camping before just kind of like that uh just str spring water into that it wasn't that dirty but and I'm, i mean i'm a little bit weird but i'm still alive <laughs> <laughs> i was also just gonna ask i know somebody already asked about a stand for it but i was also wondering i mean obviously you can't have it overflow so would somebody have to be standing there continuously pouring a small amount of water into it from their water supply mm -hmm. 
So the thought is that um, when you make this, when it is a little bit larger, there is a large section at the top um, that is open that you could pour a large amount into. Um, so you could definitely scale this model up as well, um, and that would probably be more effective if you wanted to go on the community scale as well. So think of it like your Brita filter at home. You have that pitcher, and you dump it in. You don't stand there watching it go the whole time. I mean, you've got a reservoir on the top that it can filter through, and then you can add a little more later. It's not going to be the whole time. The idea of our first prototype and our first model that we were making was personal filter that you'd use for either one person or like a small family. And then you could have multiples of these since you have tons of bottles lying around that you can clean those bottles and readily have this charcoal and sand available that's just around that will filter out the heavy particulates, the metals, the ions, and then you can use the SOTUS method to get rid of all the microorganisms. Anybody else? So we have another minute. Yeah, go ahead. One of, uh, when we were looking up sodas, they said not to use a bottle larger than two liters. Mm -hmm. That was one of our concerns. Um, but as long as we weren't going to fill it up all the way. Um, and yeah. <laughs> uh, the main concern with uh, the difference between two and three liter bottles is that the light wouldn't be able to penetrate enough into the bottle to be effective. Um, so that's why we would probably run it through several times um, to get that turbidity down as much as possible. Also, generally, like he was talking about earlier, like three liter bottles here in America, they're fatter, which is the issue. Um, but then when you go there, they're taller and mm -hmm. so, um, which makes it so they can still pass through. So like the actual, it's still passing through the same diameter. It's yeah, just exactly, passing through. Yeah, that's what, exactly what I was trying to cross. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> OK. Um, I'm going to uh, turn off the recording unless anybody wants to say something. Professor Anderson, we're done. We appreciate you coming. Yeah, you bet. Oh. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having <laughs> me. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Um, we are at the end of the exam period. Um, what I want to do is hang here a little bit. Anybody that would like to sit and have a little conversation about how to improve this class, I'd welcome you to stay because every year I'm going to be trying to make it better. Um, I made some pretty um, major changes since last year, um, and I hope to improve it further. So if you, if you want not to say it like in public to me, that's fine. But do fill out the course evaluation. Be frank. I, don't, I, mean, I really appreciate you know, good, honest, constructive criticisms. I listen, OK, and, and try to make it better, OK? So anyway, you guys all did a great job. I mean, when you're bringing colleagues like this, you want you guys to look really good, you know? And you guys did. I'm really proud of y'all. Um, I, I mean that. It really did a fantastic job. I'm proud to post this stuff on the, all of it on the website. And you should be too. Um, we don't want it to just go away. So the idea is next year, they have to make sure they don't do the same projects as the previous year. So it's going to get harder every year. <laughs> OK, thanks again. Thank you.